Namaste. Welcome, everybody. We are beginning today with the Devi Bhagavata Purana, Book 8, uh, Chapter 15. Um, in the midst of talking about um, cosmology and astronomy is what we've been in the middle of. Narayana said, this is Rishi Narayana, the uh, avatar of Vishnu in Badrikashrama Valley, said, O Narada, I will now describe the motion of the sun here. It is of three kinds, Shigra, Manda, um, and between the three. This refers to the progression of the sun from summer solstice to winter solstice with the days shortening, winter to summer, the days lengthening, and at the equinoxes. That's what it means by the three kinds. Every graha, or astrological planet, has three positions. The name of the Madhyagati position is Jaradgava. Uh, that's the, um, the equinox position. The name of the northern position, which means the um, sun progressing towards summer solstice is Airavata, and the name of the southern position is Vaishvanara. Uh, so, correctly pointing out here that the, the definition of these relativities of whether this, the progression of the days and nights is specific to planets and determined by planetary motion. The asterisms Ashvini Kritika and Bharani are known by the term Nagaviti. These are referring to as the uh, progression through the lunar mansions. The um, collection of the nakshatras Rohini, Ardra, and Mrgashirsha are named Gajaviti. The nakshatras Pushya, Ashlesha, and Punarvasu are named Airavati, Viti. The three Vitis above mentioned are called Uttara Marga. Purva Palguni, Uttara Palguni, and Magha nakshatras together make up Arshabhiviti. The nakshatras Hasta, Chitra, and Svati are called Goviti. The nakshatras Jyeshta, Vishaka, and Anuradha are named Jaradgaviviti. These three Vitis are named Madhyama Marga. The nakshatras Mula, Purva Shada, and Uttara Shadha are termed Ajaviti. The nakshatras Sravana, Dhanishta, and Shatabhisha are termed Mrgaviti. Um, the nakshatras Uttara Bhadrapada, Urva Bhadrapada, and Revati are called Vaishvanaraviti. These three vitis make up the Dakshina Marga. During the Uttarayana time, as the Dhruva attracts the rope of air from both the sides of the Yuga, so this refers to the way of visualizing the cosmos of Dhruva, the pole star. Um, as as the it, it depend it refers to as the sun, the course of the sun appears closer or farther from the pole star, referring to the northern or southern courses throughout the year. Uh, the chariot of the sun ascends. Thus, when the, when the sun enters within the sphere, the motion of the chariot becomes slower, and the day is lengthened and the night is shortened, referring again to uh, the closer it is to Dhruva, so to speak, to celestial north, the closer it is to the summer solstice, the longer the days, the shorter the nights. O Sura Sattama, know this to be the course of the path of the sun. When the cord draws towards the south, so to speak, the chariot descends, and as the sun then comes out of the sphere of Dhruva, the motion becomes quick. The day shortens and the night is lengthened. Again, when the cord is neither tightened nor it is slackened, rather its motion is exactly at the midway, the sun remains in a medium position, and his chariot enters within a state of equilibrium, where the day and night become equal at the equinoxes. When the cord of air in uh, a state of equilibrium is attracted by the polar star, then it is that the sun and the solar system revolves. 
and when the polar star slackens its attraction over the cord of air, the sun coming out of the middle sphere revolves, and the solar system also revolves around the sun. On the east of Meru is established the city of Indra, and the devas dwell there. It is called, therefore, Devadhanika, the dwelling place of the devas. On the south of Meru is the famous city of Yama, the god of death, named Semgimani. On the west of Meru is the great city of Varuna, named Nimnochani. On the north of Meru is the city of Soma, the city of the moon, named Vibhavari. O Narada, the Brahmavadis, the philosophers, say that the sun first rises in the city of Indra. In other words, it rises in the east. At noon, the sun goes to Samyamani. At evening, the sun goes to Nimnochini, um, and he is said to set. And in the night, the sun remains in Vibhavari. Omuni, the going of the sun round Meru, is the cause of all the beings getting themselves engaged in their respective duties. The inhabitants of the Meru mountain see the sun always in the central position. The sun moves on eastwards towards the stars, keeping the Meru to his left. But if the zodiac be taken into account, it would appear that Meru is left towards the south of the sun. The rising and setting of the sun are always considered in front of him. O Devarishi, every point, every quarter, every person seeing the sun says that the sun has risen there. In other words, the rising of the sun is a matter of perspective. It's not an ontological change in the nature of the sun itself, as, of, as we, of course, know. It seems to rise for us, depending on where we are. Again, where the sun becomes, wherever the sun becomes invisible to one, he is considered to set there from the perspective of a person on that location. The sun always exists the same. There is no rising nor setting for him. It is his appearance and disappearance relative to perspective that make men say that the sun rises or sets. Of course, we know this. When the sun is in the city of Indra, he illumines the three cities, those of Indrayama and Soma, and illumines the northeast and um, east-west corners. So when he rests in the city of fire, um, the Purana did not actually mention the city of fire, it only mentioned the four main cities, but uh, we know from other Puranas, the city of fire is in the southeast. He illumines northeast, east-west, and southwest, these three corners, and at the same time, the cities of Indra and Yama, and so on for the other cities and corners. O Narada, the Mount Meru is situated towards the north of all the Dvipas and Varshas, so whenever any person sees the sun rise, he calls that side east. But Meru exists towards the left of the sun, so it is said. If the sun travels in 15 ghatikas, the distance from Indrapuri to Yamapuri, he is said to travel within that time a distance equal to two and a quarter kotis, 12 and, wa 12 and a half lakhs, plus another 25,000 yojanas, or an absolutely gigantic distance in space. Um, re referring to the fact that the motion, the speed of the movement of the sun through space is extremely fast, covering vast numbers of miles per hour. The thousand-eyed and thousand-rayed sun god is the manifester of time. He travels in the aforesaid way, the cities of Varuna, Chandra, and Indra, respectively. He, had, he is the diadem of the Svaraloka, the crown of heaven, and the zodiac is his Atman. He travels thus to mark off time to all persons by defining days and nights. O Narada, the moon and the planets, the other planets and stars, rise and set in the aforesaid manner. In other words, what it said, and what, of course, we know about how the rising and the setting of the sun are not some change that the sun actually undergoes, but rather that we see it rise and set according to our perspective. This is also true of the rising and setting of the moon and all the stars and all the other planets. Of course, we know this. Thus, the powerful chariot of the sun travels in a muhurta, um, 
that would be 14,200,000 Yojanas. By the force of Pravaha Vayu, the sun god, the incarnation of the Vedas, travels around the cities um, of the zodiac in one samvatsara, one year. The wheel of the sun's chariot is one year. Twelve months are the spokes, three chaturmasyas are the nave, and the six seasons are the outer ring or circumference of the wheel. The learned men call this chariot uh, uh, as the samvatsara, or in other words, they call they metaphorically call the year, in, uh, describe the year in terms of this solar chariot performing one revolution. The axis or axle points to the Meru on one side and to the Manasotara mountain on the other, the Manasotara mountain being uh, the ring around the ecliptic of the earth. The end or circumference of the wheel marks off other divisions of the time as Kala, Kashta, Uhurta, Yama, Parahara. These are all units of time. Day and night. One day and night or a 24-hour period and fortnights, or periods of two weeks. The wheel is fixed on the nave. The sun goes on this wheel, like an oilman's, on, an, on his oil machine, round and round the Manasotara mountain. In other words, tracing the ring of the ecliptic of the earth, from the, the ecliptic of the earth being the plane it would draw a disk in space, the, the plane in space describing the Earth's orbit around the sun, or if you speak in terms of perspective and not gravitation, it's just as valid to say the sun's orbit around the Earth. The eastern side of the wheel is on that axis, and the other part is fixed on the pole star. The dimension of the first axis uh, is... 15,750,000 yojanas. The second axis measures one fourth of the above. It resembles the axis of an oil machine. These are at least roughly correct. I mean, they're on the scale of the measurement of the solar system. The upper side of that is considered to belong to the sun. The seat of the sun on his chariot measures 36 lakh yojanas wide. The yuga measures in length one-fourth of the above dimension, that of his seat. The chariot is moved by seven horses, consisting of the seven chandas. So in other words, these horses, so to speak, are, they're not at all living creatures of horses. They are the meters of the Vedas, the poetic meters, or metrical structures of the Vedas, Gayatri, etc., driven by Aruna. These horses carry the sun for the happiness of all. Though the charioteer sits in front of the sun, his face is turned towards the west. He does his work as a charioteer in that way. 60,000 Valakilya Rishis, each the size of a thumb, go before the sun, chanting the sweet Vedic hymns. Other Rishis, Apsaras, Uragas, Gramanis, Rakshasas, and all the Devas, each divided in groups of seven, worship every month that highly lustrous sun god. So that's a vague summative statement. Um, however, we have read in the Bhagavata Purana a detailed breakdown of that, meaning that each month there is a different set. There's always one Rishi, one Apsara, one Uraga or serpent, one Gramani, one Rakshasa, etc., who form the entourage of the sun god, so to speak. And it's a rotating position month by month. And that Purana, it lists all of them by name for all the months of the year. Here we just... There's a brief mention of that system. Um, the Earth measures a vast span of yojanas. The sun passes over this distance in a moment. He does not take rest in this work even for a day. No, not even for a moment does the sun stop in its motion. And here ends the 15th chapter of the 8th book on the motion of the sun in the Mahapuranam Srimad Devi Bhagavatam of 18,000 verses by Maharshi Veda Vyasa. Chapter 16, Sri Narayana Rishi said, O Narada, now hear the wonderful movements of the planets and their positions. The auspicious and inauspicious events of humankind 
are due to the different movements of these planets, referring, of course, to Jyotish or astrology. As in a potter's wheel going round and round, the motion of the insects crawling on the wheel appears in a contrary direction, so the motion of the sun and other planets moving on the zodiac composed of the Rashis, or the constellations of the stars, which again always moves round the meadow as an axle, appears different. In other words, that the motion of the planets, the apparent motion of the planets, looks desynchronized from the motion of the background stars, which are outside of our solar system. The motion from one star to another, and from one constellation to another, appears so likewise. These two motions, therefore, are not contradictory, but are consistent. So it has settled everywhere by the learned pundits. O Narada, he who is the origin of all, who is the Adipurusha, from whom all these have sprung, who is endowed with the six extraordinary powers, in whom all this prapancha, this material world composed of the five elements, remains, that Narayana, roaming about, has divided the Trai Atma into twelve parts for the perfect happiness of all and for karma shudhis, for the purification of action. The sages, furnished with jnana and vijnana, with knowledge and wisdom, have thus argued on the point, following the path as laid out in the Vedas. The Surya Narayana, the sun god, moving on through the six seasons, uh, beginning with spring, has established cold and heat, etc., as the dharma of the seasons duly, for the fructification of the karmas of the individual beings. Those persons that worship this Adipurusha with devotion, according to the knowledge of the Vedas, the customs and usages of Varana and Ashrama, and with various performances of yogas, get their fruits respectively according to their desires. This sun is the Atman of all the Lokas, and residing in the zodiac between the heavens and the earth, enjoys the 12 months and the 12 constellations, or the 12 zodiacal signs. These months are the limbs of the year. Two fortnights make one month. The two and one quarter asterisms go to form one month according to the solar measure of day and night. So you can define a month, a lunar month, as two fortnights, the waning and plus the waxing of the moon, or a solar month of two and a quarter asterisms. The period that the sun takes to travel over the two constellations is called Ritu, or one season. Uh, this, of course, referring to the traditional Indian system of seasons, which is six seasons rather than four. The scientists say that this season is the limb of one samvatsara, or the limb of the year, and that, they li and that the year has six limbs. The path that the sun describes within the three seasons, or half the year in the zodiac, is called one ayanam, the time taken by the sun with earth and heavens to make a full circuit of the zodiac is called one vatsara, or one year. This year is reckoned into five divisions as samvatsara, parivatsara, iravatsara, anuvatsara, and idvatsara. These are functioned by the sigra, manda, and uniform motions of the sun, as we mentioned, the sun progressing from solstice to solstice through the equinoxes. So the Munis say, thus far the motion of the sun has been described. Now hear that of the moon. The moon is situated, I'll describe this, I'll, I'll explain this. The moon is situated one lakh yodanas higher than the sun and shares with the motion of the sun for one year. And she enjoys as well every month with the sun in the shape of the dark and bright fortnights. Uh, so here the moon is being referred to as feminine. But also uh, to explain what is meant by that, the moon is situated one lag yodana is higher than the sun. How are we defining higher? Uh, higher here is defined relative to the plane of the ecliptic. To if you, so the sun is considered ground level, so to speak. What we're talking about is the ecliptic is the geometric plane in space. If you draw a plane of the apparent motion of the sun from the perspective of the earth, um, in other words, you're drawing a plane through the orbit of the earth around the sun. Higher than that is measuring how far off of that plane is the moon. That's what we mean by higher.
The moon, the lord of night and of the medicinal plants, also enjoys the day and night by the help of one constellation or two and one quarter nakshatras. Thus, by her shigragati, the moon enjoys the nakshatras. During the bright fortnight, meaning the waxing, the moon becomes more and more visible and gives pleasure to the immortals by her increasing phases. And during the dark fortnight, which means her waning phase, she delights the pitris, the ancestors. So the devas during the waxing, the ancestors during the waning. She performs revolution in the day and night by uh, her both the phases of the bright and dark fortnights. In other words, her revolution is always continuing. Thus, she becomes the life and soul of all the living beings. The moon, endowed with the highest prosperity, travels one nakshatra in 30 muhurtas. Uh, so through a different lunar mansion, every 30 muhurtas, a muhurta is 48 minutes. She is full and the soul without any beginning. She fructifies the sankalpas and resolves of all, hence she is called Manomaya. She is the lord of all the oshadhis, all the medicinal plants, hence she is called Annamaya. She is filled with nectar, hence she is called the abode of immortality, and she gives nirvana to all, hence she is called Sudhakara. She nourishes and satisfies the devas, pitris, humans, reptiles, and trees, Hence, she is called Sarva Maya. By her influence, the asterisms travel over the three lakh yojanas. God himself has made the nakshatra Abhijit to revolve round the Meru, along with the other nakshatras in the zodiac, so this is reckoned as the 28th nakshatra. The planet Shukra, Venus, is situated above the moon, two lakh yojanas high. Again, same definition of above, what we mean by above, relative to the plane, the ecliptic plane of the Earth. He sometimes goes before the sun, sometimes behind, and sometimes along with him. He is very powerful. His motion is of three kinds, sigra, manda, and uniform. He is generally favorable to all the persons and does for them many auspicious things, so it is stated in the Shastras. Omuni, Shukra, the illustrious scion of Bhrugu, removes the obstacles to the rains. Next to Shukra, the planet Buddha, or Mercury, is situated two lakh yojanas high. Like, again, same definition of high. Like Shukra, he too goes sometimes in front, sometimes behind, and sometimes along with the sun. And his motion too is of three kinds, Shikra, Manda, and uniform. When Buddha, the son of Soma, is away from the sun, then ativata, abhrapata, and drought and other fears arise. So natural disasters, strong winds, hurricanes, the falling of meteors, and droughts. Natural disasters in general. The planet Mangala, or Mars, the sun of Bhumi, is situated two lakh yojanas higher. Within three fortnights, or 45 days, Mars travels one Hrashi. This occurs when his motion is not retrograde. This mangala causes all sorts of mischief, evils, and miseries to humankind. The planet uh, Guru Brahaspati, or Jupiter, is situated two lakh yojanas higher. He passes through one Rashi in one year. When his motion is not retrograde, he is always in favor with the Brahmavadis, or in other words, held to be highly auspicious by the philosophers. Next to Brahaspati, comes the planet Shani, the son of Surya. This is Saturn. Two lakh yojanas higher. He takes 30 months to pass over one Rashi. This planet causes all sorts of unrest and miseries to all. Therefore, he is called a Mandagraha, or a malefic planet. Next to it is situated the Saptarishi Mandala, the constellation of the great bear, 11 lakh yojanas higher up. Omuni, the seven planets, uh, the seven, so by, by the seven grahas, what we mean is the sun, the moon, um, Mercury, uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. These seven grahas always do special favors to all. 
they circumambulate the Vishnupada, the polar star. And here ends the 16th chapter and the 8th book on the motion of the planets in the Mahapuranam Srimad Devi Bhagavatam of 18,000 verses by Maharshi Veda Vyasa. Chapter 17. Rishi Narayana said, Beyond the Septarishi Mandalam, 13 lakh yojanas higher, are situated Vishnu's Paramampadam, the highest place of Vishnu, or Vaikuntha Loka. The great Bhagavat, the great devotee, the most respectful Sriman Dhruva, the son of Uttanapada, is established there with Indra, Agni, Kashyapa, and Dharma and the Nakshatras. The visitors always pay to him their respects. He is the patron of those who live till the end of a kalpa. He is engaged in serving the lotus feet of the Bhagavan. He has been made by God himself, the pillar around whom all the planet stars and the luminary bodies are revolving always and with great force in the zodiac and in the celestial heavens. In other words, he is the God of the pole star. The devas also worship him. He, resplendent in his own glory, illumines and manifests all. As beasts tied to the yoke go on tilling, so the planets and stars fixed on the zodiac go quickly round and round this dhruva, the pole star, some nearer, some further distant in their spheres, or their circles, propelled by Vayu. As the hawks hover round the sky, so the above-mentioned planets go completely round and round under their own karmas and controlled by the Vayu in the sky, the principle of motion. Thus all the luminaries do not fall to the ground, as they are kept up in their respective positions by the favor of the union of Prakriti and Purusha. Some say that this Jyotish Chakra, the wheel of lights, the celestial heavens, is Shishumara, or um, in the shape of a porpoise or a river dolphin. It is kept duly in its position for the purpose of holding things up by the power of the Bhagavan. Hence, it does not fall apart. It is resting with its body coiled around and with its head lower down. Omuni, Dhruva, the son of Uttanapada, is staying at the tail end of the star dolphin. And in addition to him, also at the tail, rest Brahma, the sinless Prajapati, worshipped by the gods Agni, Indra, and Dharma. Thus the creation is at the tail, and the Saptarishi Mandala is staying at his waist. Thus the Jyotish Chakra, the wheel of celestial lights, is resting with his coils turned in a right-hand direction. On his right side are found the Uttarayana Nakshatras, 14 in number, from Abhijit to Punarvasu, and on his left side are found the other 14 Dakshinayanam Nakshatras, from Pushya to Uttarashadha. O son of Brahma, Thus the nakshatras form the coil-shaped body of the Shishumara, half the nakshatras on the one side and the other half on the other. His back is on the Akasha Ganga, named Ajaviti. In other words, the Akasha Ganga is the, um, the visible Milky Way in the sky. Punarvasu and Pushya form the right and left side of the loins, Ardra and Ashlesha form the right and left feet. Abhijit and Uttarashadha form the right and left nostrils. Odevarishi, Sravana and Purvashadha form the right and left eyes, respectively. So say the persons that uh, form the kalpanas or the, the fancies or the, the metaphor of the porpoise. Dhanishta and Mula form the right and left ears. Magha and uh, etc., the eight Dakshinayana nakshatras form the bones on the left side. Omuni, Mrigashirsha, the Uttarayana nakshatras form the bones on his right side. Shatabhisha and Jyeshta form the right and left shoulders. Agasti forms the upper jaw and Yama the lower jaw. The planet Mars forms his face. Saturn forms his organ of generation, meaning his penis. Brahaspati forms the hump on the shoulders. The sun, the lord of the planets, forms his breast, Narayana remains in the heart, and the moon is in his mind. O Narada, the two Ashvins form the nipples on his breast, Ushana forms his navel, Ushana is another name for Venus. 
uh, the Buddha, the uh, planet Mercury, is his prana and apana, his ingoing and outgoing breath. Rahu is his neck, and Ketu is all over his body. And the stars are reigning over all the hairs of his body. This zodiac is the body composed of the devas of that all-pervading Bhagavan. So every intelligent person should daily meditate upon this Shishumara in the Sandhya time, and the twilight. With perfect purity and keeping himself molna, silent but meaning mentally silent. And with his whole heart. Then he should repeat the following mantras, get up and say, so standing up, say, Thou art the substratum of all the luminaries. We bow down to thee. Thou createst and destroyest all. Thou art the Lord of all the celestials. Thou art the Adi Purusha, the foremost of all the Purushas. We meditate fully upon thee. The planets, nakshatras, and the stars are thy body. The Deva, the divine principle, is established in thee alone. Thou destroyest the sins of those that compose the mantras. The sins are completely destroyed, for the time being, of him who bows down or remembers thee in the morning, afternoon, and evening. So the three Sandhya times, meaning the morning twilight or, or dawn, um, the middle sunrise, the middle Sandhya is noon, solar noon, and then the evening twilight. Here ends the 17th chapter of the 8th book on the Dhruva Mandalam, or the wheel of the celestial bodies around the pole star. And the Mahapuranam Srima Devi Bhagavatam of 18,000 verses by Maharshi Veda Vyasa. Chapter 18, Narayana said, O Devarashi, the sphere of Rahu is situated one Ayota Yojanas below the sun. Rahu, the son of Singhika, is moving there like a nakshatra, though he is not a nakshatra. This Rahu swallows up both the sun and the moon, and he has got immortality and capability to travel in the sky. The sun's rays go up to one Ayotayodanas. The Asura Rahu thus covers his rays. So the sphere of the moon extends up to the 12,000 Yodanas. Rahu covers the field of 13,000 Yodanas, so he covers both the sun and the moon. Desire to take uh, vengeance for previous enmity, he covers them during the time of Parva, during eclipses. This planet wants to cover them, this Graha. Uh, in this case, it's not accurate to refer to it as a planet, obviously. Wants to cover them from a distance. Hearing this, the Bhagavan Vishnu hurls his Sudarshana Chakra against Rahu. This Chakra is encircled with the fiery flames and is very terrible. When all the quarters are filled with its violent flames, Rahu becomes instantly alarmed and flees away into the distance. Odevarishi, this is known as the eclipse amongst the mortals. Below the sphere of Rahu, there are other pure lokas situated. Osatthama, the Siddhas, Charanas, and Vidyadharas live in those lokas. Their dimensions are one Ayuta Yojanas. Odevarishi, below them live the Yakshas. Rakshasas, Pishachas, Pretas, and Bhutas, with their excellent viharas, or excellent residences. The learned people call this Antariksha, or the region of middle space, um, in the atmosphere. It extends up to where the wind blows violently, and where the clouds appear. The so best of the twice-born below this Antariksha, or the atmosphere, is this earth, measuring 100 yojanas. Um, that, that should be 1,000 yojanas. 1,000 yojanas is just about correct measurement. All the articles and things of the earth are found here. Birds, herons, cranes, and ducks all fly over the earth. The earth consists of this. Now as described the configuration within the earth of the underworlds, of the asuras. Odevarashi. Um Within this earth, there are seven places, um, talas, caves or nether regions, underworlds. Their diameter is one ayutayodanas. In all the seasons, all sorts of enjoyments can be had in these places. The first is atala, 
The second is Vitala, and next common order is Sutala, Talatala, Mahatala, Rasatala, and lastly, the seventh, the Patala Loka. So all seven of them are often called the Patalas, but the seventh and final of them is specifically named Patala Loka. Ovipra, thus the seven underworld regions are reckoned. These are termed the Vilasvargas, or the underworld heavens, and they yield happiness greater than those of Svargaloka. These are all filled with lovely amorous enjoyments, prosperity, and happiness. They are crowded with gardens and viharas. And these viharas, these houses or buildings there, are all decorated tastefully so as to furnish a special tastes of enjoyments. The powerful daityas, danavas, and nagas enjoy here great happiness incessantly, united lovingly with their children, their wives, and friends. The householders also pass their time at ease and enjoyment, surrounded by their friends and attendants. They are all mayavis, or magicians, and their resolves are not thwarted. Uh, they seem more than God in this respect, and they are filled with desires. They constantly have desires and constantly get them fulfilled. They all live with joy and in enjoyments, and they find pleasures in all seasons. Maya Sura, the lord of Maya, had built separate cities as he liked in those nether regions. Uh, and besides the cities, he has created thousands of dwelling places, palaces, and town gates studded with gems and jewels. The assembly halls, chatvaras, and chaityas are elaborately decorated and rare even to the suras, to the devas. The nagas and asuras live in those houses with their consorts, doves and pigeons, and female maina birds are hovering there. In those places, many plots marked out artificially and excellent rows of palatial buildings of the lords of those viharas adorn those regions. Uh, very big gardens also exist there. All these cheer the minds, and to add to their beauty, many places of fruits and flowers are close by, fit for the comfort and enjoyments of the ladies. The tanks and pools of water are crowded with various birds. The lakes are filled with clear waters, and the Patina fishes abound there. The aquatic animals move in the waters, violently agitating them. Various kinds of lotuses, Kumuda, Utpala, Kalhara, Blue Lotus, Red Lotus, are fully blown in these lakes and reservoirs of water. The gardens there are all overcrowded with the viharas of the inhabitants there, and echo with sweet melodious music pleasing to the senses. For there these places seem to vie with the heavens. No fear is there, whether during the day or the night. The gems on the crest of Nagas constantly illumine the environments, and there is no darkness there at any, at any time. The food there is prepared with divine medicines, and they drink and bathe with medicinal plants so that no disease attacks them. Old age, fever, indigestion, paleness, sweats, bad smells, loss of energy, or any other source of trouble cannot, uh, cannot trouble the beings there. The people are always happy and good. Only they fear the Teja of the Bhagavan and his Sudarshana Chakra. They fear nothing else. When the Teja of the Bhagavan enters, uh, the women miscarry who are pregnant. Here ends the 18th chapter of the 8th book on the narrative of Rahu Mandalam in the Mahapuranam Srimad Devi Bhagavatam of 18,000 verses by Maharshi Veda Vyasa. Chapter 19, Narayana said, O Vipra, in the first beautiful region, Atala Loka, the exceedingly, the first one going down deeper and deeper, the exceedingly haughty son of the Danava Maya, named Bala, Bala Sura, is living. He has created the 96 Mayas, or the 96 uh, illusions of magicians. All the requisites of the inhabitants of Atalaloka are obtained by use of these 96 magic spells. The other Mayavis know one or two of these, of these 96. None of them are capable to know them all, as they are ex each one of them is exceedingly difficult to be carried out, and so no one can master all 96 except for Bala himself or other great, like Mayasura, and so on. When this powerful Bala yawned, 
three classes of women were produced, fascinating to all the lokas, named uh, Pumschali, Svairini, and Kamini, uh, various types of particularly um, seductive women. When any man, beautiful and lovely to them, any man who they find beautiful and lovely, enters into their Atala region, ruled by these women, these Asuri women, they, with the help of the um, Hataka Rasa, uh, the uh, Hataka elixir, it's an aphrodisiac elixir, generate in him, while in solitude, the power to enjoy, and with their sweet smiles and amorous lovely looks, and with great care, embrace him thoroughly and begin to converse with him and with amorous gestures and postures, and thus please him well. When the people enjoy this Hatakarasa elixir, they think again and again that they have become like gods, they have become siddhas and powerful like Ayuta elephants. It's an, an intoxicant. Being blind with vanity and finding themselves endowed with power and prosperity, they think themselves so repeatedly and constantly. O Narada, thus the position in Atala has been described. Now here the description of the second region, the Vitala Loka. Vitala is situated further below. There the Bhagavan Bhava, or Shiva, worshipped by all the devas, has assumed the name of Hatakeshvara and is staying there coupled with Bhavani, surrounded by his attendants, especially for the increase of the creation of Brahma. In other words, it is a place of sexual reproduction. The river Hattaki flows there. It has origin from the sexual fluids of them both, flowing forth so copiously as to form a river. Fire augmented by the help of the wind begins to drink it, or dry it, when the fire leaves that, making a putkara noise, uh, the sound of forcefully blowing out air through the mouth, or the hissing of fire. Along the edges of that river, the gold named Hataka gold is created through an alchemical process. This gold is very much prized by the Daityas. The Daitya women use this gold always for their ornaments. Below Vitala is Sutala Loka. It is reckoned as of some special importance among the Talas. Omuni, the highly meritorious Bali, the son of Virochana, lives there. Bhagavan Vasudeva brought down this Bali into Sutala for the welfare of Indra. He assumed the body of Trivikrama, that is the Vamana avatar or dwarf avatar of Vishnu, and gave to Bali all the wealth of the three Lokas. All the Lakshmi, or the wealth, went to him and installed him in the position of the Lord of the Daityas. What more can be said than this? That what prosperity, wealth, and riches that Indra cannot obtain, that Sri Lakshmi Devi herself has followed and given to Bali. Bali, as the Lord of Sutala, has become entirely fearless and remains here up to this day and is worshipping Vasudeva. O Narada, it is said by the high-minded persons that when Vasudeva himself, the controller of all, appeared as a beggar, Bali gave him land, and therefore, on account of making gift to a good person, he acquired so much prosperity. But this cannot be reasonable, for it is not at all reasonable to cast the effects of making this gift on Narayana, or Narada, who is self-manifest by his own extraordinary glory and who is himself filled with all the Aishvarya and who can bestow the highest goal of life and other requirements of humans. This Narayana is the deva of the, uh, is the deva of the devas. If anybody takes his name, when in the greatest stress, he gets himself immediately freed from the gunas, the cause of bondage due to his karma. All persons perform many yogas and follow paths advised by the Sankhya method with their minds directed to the all-controller, Bhagavan, to abandon all sorts of troubles and miseries. O Narada, know that the Bhagavan does not show us his favor when he gives us the greatest wealth and prosperity. For wealth and riches are the offspring of Maya and the source of all worries, miseries, and mental troubles, and one is liable to forget the Bhagavan when one gets such a wealth. The Bhagavan is pervading all this universe and is full of wisdom, and he is seeing always all the ways and means. He took away in the way of begging, uh, rather cheated all that Bali had, leaving only his body, and at last, finding no other means, fastened him by the Varunapasha and threw him in the middle of the mountain cleft in a cave, and then has stationed himself at his door as a doorkeeper. Once out of extreme devotion, Bali did not care at all for his difficulties, troubles, or miseries. 
Rather, he gave out that Indra, whose minister is Brahaspati, had acted very foolishly. For when the Bhagavan becomes graciously pleased, he wanted from him ordinary wealth. In other words, he said that Indra was foolish to ask only wealth of Bhagavan when he could have asked anything. But what, said Bali, well, the wealth of the three worlds avail. It is quite an insignificant thing. Surely, said Bali, he is an illiterate and stupid brute who for mere wealth leaves the Bhagavan, who is the fountain of all good wishes to living beings. My grandfather Pralada, said Bali, who was highly fortunate, who was devoted to the god, and who was always ready to do good to others, did not ask for any other thing than Dasya Bhava, to always be the servant of God. When his powerful father died, the Bhagavan offered him unbounded wealth, but the Bhagavata Pralada did not want that. None of us who are marked with so many deficiencies can know the nature of the Bhagavan Vasudeva, whose omnipotence cannot be compared, and all these manifested worlds are but his upadhis. O Devarashi, thus Bali, the lord of Daityas, highly respected and renowned in all the lokas, is reigning in Sutala. Hari himself is his Dvarapala, or doorkeeper. Once the king Ravana, source of torment to all the people, went out to conquer the whole world, and when he entered Sutala, that Hari, ever ready to show grace to his devotee, threw Ravana at a distance of one Ayuta Yojanas by kicking him with the toe of his foot, and thus protected Sutala Loka from the conquest of Ravana. Thus, by the grace of the Deva Deva Vasudeva, Bali is reigning in Sutala and enjoying all sorts of pleasures without any equal anywhere. Here ends the 19th chapter of the 8th book on the narrative of the Atala, etc., in Srimad Devi Bhagavatam, the Mahapuranam of 18,000 verses by Maharshi Veda Vyasa. Chapter 20. Narayana Rishi said, O Narada, the loka lower down than Suttala is Talatala Loka. The lord of Tripura, the three cities, the great Maya Dhanava, is the ruler of this region. Maheshvara, the doer of good to the three worlds, burnt his three cities, but at last, being pleased with his devotion, he rescued Maya Sura. Thus Maya, by the favor of that god, Shiva, has regained his own kingdom and the enjoyments thereof, here in Talatala Loka. This Maya Dhanava is the Acharya of the Mayavi sect and the cult thereof, of sorcerers and uh, magicians. And he is skilled in various Mayas, or all sorts of the magic powers and illusions. All the fierce demons of cruel temper worship him for their prosperities in their various enterprises. Next after this Talatala is the most renowned Mahatala. The children of Kadru, the very angry Nagas, live here. They are many-headed. Ovipra, I now mention to you the names of some of the famous amongst the Nagas of Mahatala. Kuhaka, Takshaka, Sushena, and Kalia. These all have very wide hoods and they are all very strong. They are all of cruel temper. Their kinsmen also are so. They are always afraid of Garuda, the Raja of birds. Surrounded with their children, wives, friends, and acquaintances, they live happily, well-skilled in various sports and pleasures. Lower down from this Mahatala is Rasatala Loka. Daityas, Danavas, and the Pani Asuras live here. Besides these, there live the Nivata Kavachas of the Hiranyapura city, and the Asuras named the Kaleyas, enemies of the Devas. These are all, all these five different clans of Asuras, of Rasatala, are naturally very energetic and brave. Their powers are baffled by the Tejas of the Bhagavan, and so they live here like snakes in this region, prevented from attacking the worlds above. The other asuras that were driven and were afraid of the mantras uttered by Sarama, the messenger dog of Indra, live here too. Those are the Panis, specifically, one of the five asura clans. O Narada, lower down is Patala Loka, where live Vasuki, the chief of all the Nagas, and other Nagas named Shanka, Kulika, Shveta, Dhananjaya, Mahashanka, Dhritarashtra, Shankarchuda, Kamvala, Ashvatara, and Devopadattaka, uh, Devo all very angry 
of wide hoods and virulently poisonous. Some of these have five heads, some seven, some 10, some a hundred, some have a thousand heads, uh, while some others have on their crests exceedingly luminous jewels. By these rays, they dispel the darkness of the nether regions, but they are awfully prone to anger. At the bottom of this patala, and at a distance of 30 yodanas, a portion of Bhagavan in the shape of the infinite darkness is reigning there. O Devarishi, all the devas worship this form. The devotees call him by the name of Sankarshana, as he is the manifested emblem of Aham, and the common ground where the seer and the seen blend into one. He is the thousand-headed controller of all, moving and non-moving. He is of infinite forms. He is Shesha. This whole universe is being held like a mustard bean atop his head. He is of the nature of intelligence and bliss, and he is self-manifest. When he wants to destroy all this universe during the Pralaya, the very powerful Sankarshana Rudra, well arrayed with the eleven vyuhas, our military arrangements, springs up from him. From his central eyebrow, looking wide with his three eyes and raising his trident resplendent with the three flames. All the principal nagas ruling over many other nagas come to him during the nights, filled with devotion and surrounded with bhaktas and bow down to him with their heads bent low. And they look at each other's faces, illumined with the lights from the jewels shining with clear luster on the nails of the red toes of Sankarshana's lotus feet. At that time, their faces become brilliant with the rays emitting. So he has both a serpent form, but also his form is like Balarama, the, um, the very pale white-skinned brother of Krishna clad in dark blue. At that time, their faces become brilliant with the rays emitting from the jewels in the top of their very gay encircled hoods, and their cheeks look beautiful and shining. The daughters of the Nagaraja also do like this. When very beautiful rays come out of their perfectly excellent bodies, their arms are wide extended. They look very clear and they are beautifully white. They use always sandal paste, aguru, and Kashmiri unjuments. Being overpowered by amorous passion due to their conduct, contact with the scented things, they look at him with bashful glances and sweet smiles and expect benedictions from him. And then his eyes roll, maddened with love, and, ex and he expresses signs of kindness and mercy. The Bhagavan Ananta Deva is of boundless strength. His attributes are infinite. He is the ocean of infinite qualities. He is the Adi Deva of a very good nature, and his nature is highly luminous. He has abandoned anger and envy, and he wants the welfare of all. All the Devas worship him, and he is the repository of all sattvic qualities. The devas, siddhas, asuras, uragas, um, uragas are serpents like nagas, vidyadharas, gandharvas, and munis always meditate on him. On account of his constant madaraga, the enthusiasm and intoxication, his, uh, his sight appears intoxicated and his eyes look perturbed with emotions. He is always pleasing to those who surround him and to the devas by his sweet nectar-like words. The Vajayanti garland hangs from his neck. It never fades, and it is always decorated with fresh and clear tulsi leaves. Maddened bees make their humming noises incessantly and thus add to the beauty. He is the deva of the devas, and he wears a blue-colored cloth and is ornamented with a single earring. He, undecaying and immutable, um, resting his fleshy arms or his thick arms on the halakakuda or the um, farmer's plow. He is upholding the golden girdle as the elephant Airavata of Indra uphold the golden girdle or holds up the um, support of the world. O Narada, the devotees describe him as the source of this leela of the universe and the controller of the devas. And here ends the 20th chapter of the 8th book on the narrative of the Talata Laloka and the Mahapuranam Srimad Devi Bhagavatam of 18,000 verses by Maharshi Veda Vyasa. Chapter 21, Narayana said, O Devarishi, Sanatana, the son of Brahma, 
recites thus in the assemblies of the devas there, the glories of the Bhagavan Ananta Deva, and worships him thus. How can one of ordinary sight and understanding grasp the real nature of Brahman, whose mere glance enables the Prakriti to work her gunas in the creation, preservation, and destruction of this universe? Him whose nature has no beginning nor end, who though one, has created all this prapancha, the universe of five elements, as a covering to the Atman. He has made the real and unreal out of his infinite compassion, this universe full of cause and effect visible in his one and only shuddha sattva nature, for even the very powerful lion is imitating his lila, void of all defects, to bring under his, under his control the minds of his own kinsmen. To whom else, then, the persons desirous of moksha will take refuge, the mere hearing or reciting whose name in a fallen or distressed condition, or even merely in jest, instantly takes away all the sins. He is upholding the earth with mountains, oceans, rivers, and all the beings, like an atom upon his thousand heads. He is infinite. His power knows no decrease at any time. No one can describe his actions even if one had a thousand tongues to speak them. He is of infinite strength of endless high qualities and of unlimited understanding. Thus staying at the bottom of the worlds, the Bhagavan Anantadeva is upholding with ease this earth for her protection, unaided and independent. O Muni, the people get the fruits of their actions and desires as they want and as they have followed the paths laid down in the Shastras and become accordingly kings, humans, deer, birds, or other creatures in other states. O Narada, this I have described as you questioned me before, the various and dissimilar fruits of various actions done according to the dictates of the Dharma and the Shastras. Narada said, O Bhagavan, kindly describe to me now, why has the Bhagavan created so many diversities when the karmas done by the jivas are the same? Narayana said, O Narada, so many different states arise because the sradhas of the doers are so very different. The fruits differ because the sradhas vary some being sattvic, some rajasic, and some tamasic. If the sradha be sattvic, happiness comes always. If it be rajasic, incessant pain and misery is the result. If it be tamasic, misery comes and the loss of the knowledge or go of good or bad is the result. Thus the fruits differ as the sradha varies. O best of dvijas, thousands and thousands of different states occur to a human as the result of their karmas done under the influence of the beginningless avidya. Odvijottama. I will now mention in detail their varieties here. Behind this Triloki, below this earth and over the Atala, the Pitris named the, Agnish the Agnishvatas and other ancestors live. Those Pitris stay there and practicing their deep samadhi, they offer always to their best, to their best ability, blessings to their own gotra, their own families, respectively. Their Yama, the god of the ancestors, Give pun gives punishment to the dead brought there by his messengers according to their karmic faults. By the command of the Bhagavan, the Yama, surrounded by his own uh, ganas, judges and does full justice according to the karmas that they had done and the sins they had committed. He sends always those of his messengers, the Yamadutas, who obey his order and know the tattva of dharma and who are posted to their respective duties to carry out what he commands. The writers of the Shastras describe 21 Narakas, or hells or purgatories. Others say that there are 28. Their names are Tamisra, Antatamisra, Raurava, Maharaurava, Kumbhipaka, Kala Sutra, Asipatra Kanana, Sukaramukha, Antakupa, Krimi Bhojana, Taptamurti, Samdamsha, Vajra Kandaka, Shalmali, Vaitarani, Uyoda, Pranarodha, Vishasana, Lala Bhaksha, Sayara Medhaya, Sara Medhaya, Sara Mayadana, Avici, Apahpana, Kshara Rakshogana, Sambhoja, Shula Prota, Dandasuka, Avatarodha, Pariyavartanaka, and Suchimukha. These are the 28 Narakas. These Narakas are very tormenting. O son of Brahma, the embodied jivas suffer these according to their own karmas, respectively. Here ends the 21st chapter of the 8th book on the narrative of the Narakas and the Mahapuranam Srimad Devi Bhagavatam of 18,000 verses by Maharshi Veda Vyasa.
And that is where we will pause for today. Having gone over all the list of the underworlds. Amazing. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, thank you guys for coming. Uh, I thought it was interesting that uh, the Patalas are quote unquote happier than the heavens. Yes. Uh, the Puranas also, are, they're they're all the Puranas are all consistent on this that the Patalas, not the Narakas, but the Patalas, um, are. Oh, what's the difference? The Narakas, Narakas are the are the purgatories or the the hells, so to speak, but they're they're temporary. So unlike. Uh, like Christian hell, for instance, for instance, but the the places of suffering. But the patalas are totally separate from the narakas. They are places of pleasure, greater and more intense than that of svarga. Wow. Uh, yeah. But then, what? Why would you want to go to svarga then? <laughs> Is it like better karmically? I'm assuming. Um. They're actually quite similar. Um, and the Puranas advise against trying to go to either. Um, the, both, both Svarga and the Patalas are places of intense um, sensory pleasure and mental pleasure, but they're very... Uh, they're places that tend to just be places of great sensory attachment. Um, right. It's it's it, they don't immediately come with the downsides of sensory attachment that we have here, which is often here in this world, we want things and can't get them there. Whatever you want, you can get. And it goes on for a long time, uh, but it's essentially just an entrapment in Maya. It will eventually end. And it doesn't they, they are not places where uh, th there are places where it is almost impossible to attain moksha. Uh, they're not. Whoa. They're not they're not places of sadhana or spiritual progress. They're just places of enjoying the fruits of good karma. And once it's over, then you take rebirth. Um, huh. So it's a it's a reward. Cause pleasure to others. You'll get it yourself, and you uh, in places like that, and then you'll be born again. But it's not a it's not a ultimate end goal. It's like a vacation that you yeah. you earned. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Exactly. Incredible. So you might get the Swarga version or the Patala version, depending on your what exact karmas you did, and also your vasanas or your um, the tendencies of your consciousness might predispose you to one or the other. But they're rather similar ultimately in their nature. Right, because then there's like the the the, the one Patala where Hari is in the Sankarsana form. That's at the very bottom, yes. Okay, and he is infinite darkness, but he's also in hit form, and yeah. he's also intoxicated on what? Aromatherapy or something like that it was? <laughs> or what? Yeah. Uh, and then, and then, but then it's also a repository of all sattvic qualities. How are they intoxicated in a, 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 a such a sattvic uh, state? Sankarsana is um, <clears throat> beyond the power of the lower gunas. Uh, in intoxication is very much his lila. This is uh, Sankarsana. This is both Shesha Naga, the serpent, and also Balarama, Krishna's big brother. They're one and the same. Um, intoxication is very much his lila, but he is beyond uh, rajas and tamogunas have no power over him, and so uh, unlike humans who cannot achieve this typically, um, there may actually be some exceptions to that, but unlike <laughs> but typically humans cannot achieve simultaneous sattva and intoxication, but sankarsana absolutely can. That's the nature of his lila. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Wild. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, and real, real, yeah, real sure. quick, uh, what's mm -hmm. the what's the difference between a daikya and a donava? 
So there are two, those are the two main Asura clans. We actually got all five Asura clans mentioned. Normally you just hear those two. The other ones are the Panis, right. the Panis, the um, Kalakayas and the Nevata Kavachas. The, the, the two main ones are the Daityas and the Danavas. They're two, they're both, they're um, matrilineal. The, Don, the Danavas are they're descended from their clan mother Danu and, um, and the Daityas from their clan mother Diti. So they, it's essentially just matrilineal lines. Now in practice, they're so intermarried that any given Asura is probably a Daitya and a Danava. And the distinction is more important to them than it is to us in their clan structure and their way their families are organized. But they're very similar to each other. Well, what do you mean by mother lineage? I didn't quite understand. Um, so so the the Asuras trace their lineage matrilineally through the line of their mothers. Um, right. th and the the first clan mother, the like the goddess who was the first mother of all the Danavas was Danu. And of the Daityas was Diti. So they kind of, like the eldest matriarch of their line, who they consider to be the mother of their whole clan. So interesting. Yeah. And so their clans are still <laughs> named after them. Right. I also found the first half of the discussion around space and everything so fascinating. And, was, mm -hmm. and it's so interesting how it was mentioned that the sun doesn't actually set and rise. Oh, I, yeah, I, I didn't course. expect that to be I didn't yeah. expect that to be known at that time oh, and right. um, yeah. yep. so that was amazing and and also I was just interested in whether because all the speeds of different um, bodies that were mentioned I'd love to compare them with what modern science knows now but I don't understand the Sanskrit or Hindi version so I was wondering if you have that or if you ever have time to translate please. yeah so um so essentially it's um the key measurement is the yojana that they keep using um a yojana in this context is just about eight miles okay um and if you know the rest are just numbers like one ayuta yojana is, is just a number you can you can easily look it up and do all the calculations um a lot okay. of it is actually quite accurate there um but you have to understand it's it's such a different construct of how they're describing the solar system. They're measuring things based on distances from the ecliptic plane of the Earth, but they, the way they mm -hmm. phrase everything and, and the standards of measurement are so different from what's used in modern astronomy that you really have to study and figure out in quite a lot of detail how mm -hmm. they were how they were describing it in order to actually do the comparison. Um, yeah, but there's actually a, a quite an impressive degree of accuracy if you do all that. Okay. Yeah. And one more question: You said about the three Sundays. You said solar noon for the middle one. What do you mean by that? So not noon on the clock, but the point when the sun is at its highest, um, based on like okay. daylight savings time that can be off by an hour, based on from from clock noon to solar noon. Or also, depending on where in the time zone you are, it could be off by close to an hour if you're near the edge of a time zone. So you can you can look up solar noon for your location. Um, it's okay. within a couple hours of noon on the clock on any given day. Right. Yeah. You. Ooh, one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, the great what's the great bear? Uh, it's a constellation. What's that referring to? It's a constellation of stars. Is it one of the twelve? uh signs like Sagittarius or something or that's a good question I believe it is but I'm actually not entirely sure off the top of my head and how are they referring to it again if if you're like what was they were they kept bringing it up are you referring with, to uh, sorry the great ahead. bear uh just like when they were talking about the underworlds and stuff they were talking about the great bear being a center point um not for the underworlds the, it, it is it is okay. a it is a very important constellation for the uh when they're talking about the nakshatras and the various divisions of the stars oh yeah, um, yeah. in the sky yeah it's a, it's a okay, constellation yeah. they refer to a lot yeah okay yeah yeah it was it was when they were talking about mars and the moon and everything yeah yeah, yeah, planets. yeah 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 um, it's a it's a constellation of stars 
Oh, and they're okay. talking about the pole star a lot, weren't they? Yeah, like they talk about the, the pole star. Yes, the pole star a lot. The pole star is separate from the great oh, yeah. bear. The pole star is called Dhruva. Dhruva Taru is Sanskrit for the pole star. Yeah, that's the which that's, the little bo the little boy the boy that did his penance. That's the same one. Dhruva. Yeah, did yeah. He ascended same, to that, become that, right? Same Dhruva. Yeah, he he ascended to become king of the star gods and was um, installed mm. within the polar star by Vishnu as a great celestial being. Yeah. As promised. That's right. Yeah. Um, and it, what's the difference between that and uh, Vishnupada? Vishnupada. Um, Vishnupada literally means Vishnu's foot or from Vishnu's foot. What was the, what was the context? You have the context of Vishnupada because that's used in a few different contexts. Oh, um, uh, yeah. Um, it was as that. if it was a, a pole star itself or a constellation. It, it may have been referring to Dhruva being at Vishnu's foot in the sense of oh, as yeah. a devotee. Um, Vishnupada is also sometimes used to refer to the Ganga River um, flowing from the foot of Vishnu, as it is said. Um, there's a lot of different uses of Vishnu. It just means Vishnu's foot. So there's a, it's used in many contexts. Okay, and it would be very directly correlated to Dhruva's constellation, I'm sure. Certainly, Dhruva is all is considered to always be at Vishnu's foot in the sense of he okay. is a devotee who is always worshiping Vishnu. Oh, might have been referenced. It might have been brought up just like that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank thank you. you guys. Thank you guys very much for coming. Mm -hmm. Cheers, Haribo, Jay Ma. Mm -hmm.